so a little about me after uh, we've already been through a little bit of this. Uh, I've co-founded five startups uh, basically over the last 12 years uh, in a ton of different industries. Uh, I am CMO of a venture-backed startup. I, I think I need to update some of the LinkedIn uh, 12 plus years of experience. Not that that matters. I think it all kind of blends together. Um, I've published a few e-marketing books. have been published uh, in entrepreneur.com. Uh, I made a fair amount, not, not a fair amount of money, but the ability to live above ground by consulting on SEO, SEM, ASO, and a bunch of other uh, abbreviations. And I do consider myself a mentor, startup junkie, uh, technical marketer, and growth hacker. A uh, little fun fact, I was on a reality show about a year and some change ago. Uh, it was called House Hunters International, and they made me look like a total tool. Uh, so if you want to check that out, I come off as a right douchebag. So uh, by all means, look it up on YouTube. Um, I'm, I'm definitely going to deliver these slides afterwards so you guys have them. Uh, and don't worry about taking all the notes. It'll be there. I don't need to go through the table of contents because it's more so for you to find later. So my goal for today is to provide value. I, I want everybody to be able to come away from this having felt like they at least learned one thing and hopefully with all the shit that I'm covering, there's, there's gonna be hopefully a dozen things that you're able to implement right away. Uh, so it's always good to get an understanding of the makeup of the room. Um, so out of the people that are here, uh, how many of you are uh, still students, not actually graduated yet, show of hands? Okay, cool. Uh, how many of you are founders or are working on your own startup? All right, less, okay. And in terms of people from Valuer, just a show of hands. All right, <laughs> nice. So it's one of those things when, uh, within my program, kind of the marketing department within Valuer, I try to make sure that I do some learning lessons throughout the week so that everybody gets a little bit more than, than what you're kind of doing during the job. So a lot of this stuff will hopefully be valuable to those that are currently working with me and also those that, uh, yeah, have not had the chance yet. Um, so I'm gonna be covering a lot of different areas and I think it's important to remember that marketing in general is all about understanding systems. So the idea is that I have a bunch of dots interconnected. The whole concept is if you understand one system really well, you can apply your learnings to all these other systems and get a lot better. So the concept is very straightforward. If you wanna focus on SEO, great. You can apply your knowledge from SEO uh, or social media to then go over to content marketing or potentially automation. The whole idea is get good at one thing first. So without further ado, let's dive in. Cool, so branding strategy is one of those fun things that I think we all hear a lot about. There's a lot of people that claim to be a branding strategy consultant. I think everybody could probably end up putting that on their LinkedIn and nobody's gonna argue the point. Uh, there's, there's a lot of BS involved in there, um, but some of the basics are the stuff that I'm gonna cover here. So getting a logo made up, getting something in the way of a style sheet, color theory as it applies to your messaging and sticking to that, which is often very difficult. If you ask any current designer, it's so difficult because you have the entire rainbow to potentially work with, but sometimes you're kind of st stuck in this rigid area of four kind of main primary colors and four secondary. So it's something to bear in mind, and then I'll touch on tone. Um, so this was a logo of a sandwich place that was right down the road from my old place. Maybe you can see what that logo resembles, uh, a penis. So. <laughs> It's one of those things, like I don't understand, you don't have to do that when you're designing a logo and it's very odd that that's the, the logo they went with, but it is memorable, so there is something to that potentially. Um, it, <laughs> I don't know, it was one of those things I always found fun. I was like, hey, let's go to the, the cock sandwich place. Um, <laughs> but yeah, there's a lot of different ways that you can get logos done up uh, on the cheap. So if you're not a designer, not a big deal. Go to Conquer.io or Fiverr. There's plenty of people that are offering a free logo or a cheap logo basically for the cost of five bucks. Uh, it's, it's just one of those things, why not? Uh, and if you're really into making your own, cool. There's Logo Joy, there's of course Photoshop, and there's thousands of uh, basically like how-to videos on how to do that stuff. So I'm not gonna dive too deep into that or make a friend as I said at the bottom. Uh, in terms of some of the, the stuff that I think people overlook, a font type can be really important. 
I've, I've seen some people use Comic Sans uh, even now, and Comic Sans has kind of developed this reputation of like, what is this, amateur hour? But it's one of those things that even now I still see professional sites as consultancies using Comic Sans. Pick one font, one font and stick with it. And that's the idea. Over at Valuer, we use Gotham. That's a paid font and I don't really see a major difference between Gotham and Maserat, but hey, it, it is what it is. Uh, the idea is that you need to basically keep in mind that your typography matters. So if you're using three different sizes on your website, then continue that kind of structure throughout. A lot of the idea behind design is supposed to be, hey, freedom and like, you know, relax and make something creative. But the reality is you have to get rigid with your structure so that when somebody takes a quick glance at your website, they know, oh, that's this brand or something you put out on social media, like, oh, that's from these guys. Without even having to see the logo, they know it's you because of either the way that you've used the colors or your specific font or your very recognizable logo. Uh, there's free style guides online. They look a lot like this. I think it's so important to have something that's just basic that's, that's kind of giving you a roadmap to stay with and, and, and focus on trying to align yourself with that brand. Color theory is a lot of fun when you break it down to its simplest parts. You know, depending on your business and what you do, I think there's a lot of different ways to pick colors that kind of surround that. The other concept is then providing complementary colors that don't necessarily bore people or come off as jarring. And I think if you look at the stuff that tends to convert more, it's, it's by and large some of these more brighter colors that you kind of see down there as opposed to the lighter shades, but you could certainly make a case either way. So, I mean, there's a ton of different types of logos that are here in terms of like all of these yellow logos display optimism. Now, I don't know how much truth there is to that in terms of, I don't know, Subway sandwiches, but hey, maybe it's a thing, I, I don't know. Uh, but something to consider. From the standpoint of saving a, a ton of time, uh, there's templates out there. Don't reinvent the wheel. It's, it's so aggravating when I see people that decide, okay, cool, I'm gonna make five social media templates and they spend the better part of two weeks doing that. Somebody's already done the work for you. If you Google the phrase free social media templates, you'll get a ton of templates that you can just change the colors. And they're good, like they're really fucking good. So you don't have to reinvent what somebody's already done a great job with. Or take the, the file directly from elements.invado.com they, I believe, still have a trial uh, version that allows you to kind of get in. This guy's loving it. Uh, <laughs> you right, buddy? No, they got my like, monster drink up there. No, it's, I'm, I'm like, I don't know why, but I was like super sick. And I, I, I was checking my temperature and I was in the morning. And All right. I was like 13 it's, it's <laughs> I'll sing you a lullaby. It's really killing me. It's really killing me. Like, uh, okay. Like, and so I was taking like the product pills, you know? Yeah. And the product pills, like, uh, like, you know, like, you know how they work, right? Yeah. They work like on the way that like they kind of like force your body to shut down so it's able to revert. Okay. And, and so like at the same time I'm like fighting like two things. <laughs> I'm on like my four coffee today. All right. And at the same time I'm taking parallel clothes that like shut you down and also I'm taking that. I feel like that. Well good luck on your nap. Uh, but if yeah, I mean if you want if you want the slides, it'll be there either way. So um so on that one's not? Test test. Oh, not. Okay. Well, you guys can hear me either way, so. <laughs> All right, well, that, that works. Um, cool, so the whole idea is that if you look up social media templates, it's there for you. Um, some of the stuff that I'd love to go into in terms of automating the way that you can create 50 social media slides all at once, uh, I, I think it's probably a good 15, 20 minute tutorial. I don't have the time to go into that today, but when you get the slides, there is a link in this particular slide, the notes section, uh, we put together basically a how-to guide on basically creating using action scripts within Photoshop. And there's plenty of tutorials that uh, are linked inside of the guide as well in terms of like videos that basically allow you to place in an action script. Here are the four or five different elements. You have picture, title, logo, <coughs> text, right? Really basic. And then within a CSV file, you put in the logo, a new picture for every image that you're creating, and then the text that goes over top of it. So the idea is you create 50 different social media posts all at once, and then you can set that for different sizes, so you're potentially able to do, I don't know, 150, 1,000, if you wanted to. 
rather than doing one at a single time, which is a giant waste of time. So the whole concept is how do I automate this? How do I make this work faster? So um, yeah, I, I would say just click on that guide. Um, your brand will evolve and, and I, I, I've had so many interesting conversations with founders, especially those that I've worked with out here in Denmark. Uh, it's, it's a special type of, of mix of, of what founders turn into. Many of them are micromanagers, which makes things relatively frustrating, but I fucking hate branding meetings. Right, so we were sitting in a, I don't care, they fucking hate me anyways. So I was sitting over at Actimo, uh, and basically we had a meeting for the better part of an hour and 15 minutes about what coffee mugs to buy, because what does it say about us as a brand? There are some things that you don't need to waste time doing because they don't have enough value for you to actually see, this is really annoying, hold on to see any benefit by doing it. So the concept of, of juxtaposing, why should we use this image versus this image and the amount of time that you're spending discussing this or the phrasing of two different words, you could have probably created 30 different posts or two long articles or whatever. Sitting there while everybody in that room is a senior manager and there's six of us, if you take that on an hourly rate, we spent roughly 4,000 kroner sitting there over the span of an hour discussing coffee mugs. Well, what if, because we're a communication platform, we have like a wider like lip because you know, like we communicate. I'm like, oh, I gotta go. Like this is the worst thing ever. So don't get focused on painting yourself into a corner of, of the little minutia, the small details, like shit's gonna come. And you're gonna put out stuff that maybe isn't perfect, but that's not why we're here. It's to be able to put out a lot of stuff, get better engagement, test stuff out. So don't get too focused on handcuffing yourself to what is this style sheet? And you can see this with other brands. So everybody's familiar with Nike's tagline, just do it. Each one of these images is from Nike, and each one of them is slightly different in terms of sizing, in terms of upper and lowercase, in terms of the way that the text is arranged. Sometimes the swoop is just and then between it. it it's crazy how many people want to get laser focused on the small details. It's not worth the time, honestly. It's really not. So I, I just really want to encourage people to avoid that. And then tone. I, I can't tell you how many meetings I've had in regards to tone. You see two different characters here, right? And how would these people sound if they were speaking the line, uh, I explain my brand like an old friend explaining something at brunch. I imagine the way that Snoop Dogg says it comes off a little bit differently than maybe David Attenborough. But that's a concept that I think you should consider. With the way that I've ever uh, explained it to any of the people that I've worked with, as well as any of the companies I've consulted for, it is always easiest to just default to, this is an old friend explaining something at brunch. Friendly, not necessarily authoritative, don't need to sound too official, don't be up your own ass, and, and quite frankly, just be informative and friendly. That's it, that's all you gotta do. So really basic stuff. Uh, the whole concept is you're going to mess up these things. It's not always going to be perfection. And it does take between 20, or sorry, 7 and 20 brand exposures to make a buying decision. <coughs> the concept is, is very simple that you need to get stuff out there. That's how you engage people. So this is where I think it starts to pick up a little bit. This is some of the social media content strategy. So we've all, <clears throat> we've all heard the phrase content is king. And I think especially within social media, we probably imagine that there's maybe three different types of posts, a standard text post, something with an image and a video. But I mean, obviously there's, there's hundreds of different types of posts when you really break it down. You know, if you look at the way that podcasts have continued to take off, I'm still not listening to more than maybe three different podcasts, but everybody and their mom, even like the fucking dog has a podcast now. It's so bizarre. I think if you're providing value, it's awesome and it's a great way to reach people, but you really need to test stuff out and see what works. Every brand's different and every piece of content, potentially as it reflects to the audience, is completely different as well. So it's a long way to go to, to say try everything. Uh, I'm doubling down on video, which is why you see cameras uh, all over. The concept is obvious, right? I mean, if you're going through on Facebook and you're scrolling through, you're seeing a lot more video. Facebook is all, uh, also doubling down on video. The reach that you have with a video post is significantly higher than if it were a picture, 
way higher than if it were just a link. And pictures, of course, are still valid, but it's a highly visual platform. They want people to stop and stare at video. Uh, and I do mention a statistic uh, down the road, but I'll, I'll throw it out here once. The idea is that 85% of video is watched without audio. That means subtitles are super important, and I'll also show some of that stuff later. The whole point behind this content, the three things that I list here in the bullet points, is discovery, awareness, and legitimize your business. Like, why, why should I care? What's relevant to me as a consumer, somebody that's gonna buy your product or service? So I, I really enjoy this, uh, this slide. It, it's uh, Jonah Berger is this guy that made a shitload of money off of writing kind of these thought strategy books, but it makes sense. The whole concept is essentially these are the different elements that you need in order to get a post to go viral, something that people will click into and resonate with them. So I'm gonna define each of these relatively quickly. The idea is social currency is stuff that we, we use to sound or look smart or sound and look cool, right? There's some things that I know I'm sharing because I want people to think like, hey, that Taylor Ryan, he's a bright guy. But you know, like, do I really like care? I don't know, I, I mean, it, we all kind of do that. Uh, the next one is triggers. I think we all know that knee-jerk reaction when something either really bothers us or it, it's something that's controversial or it, it's stuff that maybe we don't realize we all actually deal with on a regular basis, but it's something that we can all relate to. And, and there's a thousand different examples of that. Um, emotion is the strongest one. I think especially with some of the consumer, uh, like business to consumer brands, I think you find that that one tends to resonate the most with people. With business to business, it's a, a totally different ball game. I'm not gonna win on the emotion. How is this software gonna save your life? Yes? If you use this model for your social uh, media content, do you use every single one at once in one picture, or do you separate it like, my first post is about social trend, my second post is about trigger, or? Yeah. Okay, so you do it uh, No, 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 I, I would say it's very difficult to get one post out there that has a starving puppy, but something that's triggering, you know, my, like, uh, you know, id or ego. Yeah, it, it's not possible most of the time to have something that hits all these, but it's something to be aware of to say, I'm taking this, this element and trying to exploit it for my audience. So go for one at a time, see what works, combine them, see if you can have something that kind of straddles both. Um, so it's definitely all and, and none. Um, public is something that we all can relate to, so that would be like biking or the shit weather in Copenhagen. It's something that's a common uh, relational thing. A lot of memes tend to hit that, that mark. Way to go, Gabriel. Um, practical value is something that I think is the most important. Uh, it's something that I can take with me and use, and that's incredibly important when you're trying to put stuff out there on LinkedIn. Any post that highlights tools or a shortened explanation of a campaign that did well, it always ends up getting engagement. So something to consider on, on the next social media post within LinkedIn. Store, uh, practical value already touched. Stories, narratives. Narratives always work. The idea is there was this whole claim to fame of broetry on LinkedIn that essentially was, I got fired on my first day. And then people write this long story that has every line separated. And the idea was these actually ended up reaching a huge audience because anytime you hit that see more button, it's basically queuing LinkedIn into the idea of people are engaged with this, they wanna read more. So you start with a cliffhanger. And there's a, a ton of different links inside of this particular post, but for the benefits of covering a lot more stuff, I'm gonna move on. Uh, buyer personas is something that I think is often overlooked, but it's important to understand your, your customer, right? You know, like ideal customer profile is blank. And there's certainly a different way to market towards, let's say millennials versus people that are much, much more beyond that, the baby boomer sector. So you need to understand kind of who you're marketing to and why they should give a shit. And I, I think there's a lot of questions you can ask yourself, but also this is what gives you your best content. When you ask a customer, what do you want to know about my brand? They'll easily give you the most useful information that then you can promote the shit out of. Where it's like, well, do you guys test on animals? Make that a post. Like, we have never tested on any animal that didn't say no. You know, like, have fun with it. That's the idea. So I think there's a, a ton of different questions that I've, I've listed in that slide, but I'm going to move on. Uh, so this is a marketing funnel. Hopefully everybody's seen what one of these looks like. Marketing funnels are really simple. It's the whole reason that you're creating content. 
And the, the concept is I'm trying to reach people to eventually end up getting money from them. That's the whole point. Even if you're an NGO, you still probably want money, participation, or something, right? So think of this top of funnel as fucking everything, right? If it's even loosely related to your sector, your industry, your service, go for it. Find a way to tie anything into your brand. And I can't tell you how many people don't think of content that way. I mean, we wrote a post that is still one of my favorites, didn't get a lot of love, but it was 25 entrepreneurs that used to be drug dealers. That has absolutely nothing to do with innovation, right? It has nothing really to do with startups-ish, entrepreneurs, sort of. But it was a fun post that was loosely tied to it. The idea is I'm trying to engage with people and you're not always gonna hit everybody with every single thing that you put out. Realize that your audience is splintered. It's segmented in a million different ways. And what is interesting for one ideal customer is not interesting to another. So I'll show a few different ways of how to generate a few different concepts and ideas. But bear in mind, the whole idea is to make this huge kind of uh, top of funnel thing where you're bringing in everybody and then eventually close the very few that actually want to buy. It's so difficult to find those, uh, those, those real buyers. And this is just another imagined way of looking at it. I do like the last, uh, the last one on there. So delight is something that I think a lot of people overlook, especially if you're kind of engaged on the consumer side. This is always where everybody fucks up, right? So I always see like, and, and this happens here in Denmark as well, every phone company wants to get you on with like a great deal, but the fucked up thing, it's like, dude, I've been your customer for the last three years. Like, you're not gonna holler at your boy anymore? Like, what happened when I was new, you know? And that's the thing is they don't care about people once they grab their money. If you wanna keep customers forever, continue to show them a little bit of appreciation. And if you're in a business to business solution, you have very few customers, how fucking expensive is it to make sure to ship them a bottle of wine at Christmas time? It's a really small touch, but holy shit, it does amazing things when you remember that these are also people and reaching out, connecting with them or saying, hey, thanks again for being a customer. Thank you for the money that allows me to do what I love to do. It's something to consider and it's, it's something that a lot of marketers over, overlook. Uh, this, was, this post I actually love, uh, I stole from somebody else and <laughs> reworded it. Uh, and I'm gonna show how you can do that uh, yourselves. But the concept is really important in terms of strive to make something really great. The difference between meh and something really amazing is actually quite small. Uh, and the difference to me is effort, right? If you're really trying to make something outstanding, you're gonna find that the reach and the uh, ability to actually close more people off of one single post that you actually put some serious fucking effort into is amazing versus 20 posts that you just kind of threw out there haphazardly. So that's the way that I, I try to look at a lot of the stuff that we do over at Valuers. Can we get past this kind of like good enough mark? Can we do something really amazing? So I'll show a couple of different versions of that. Um, this is Dollar Shave Club. Who here has heard of Dollar Shave Club? All right, nice, almost everybody, cool. The guy sold their company for a billion dollars after three years, and it basically started with one very well-made explainer video. Uh, it's linked in the slides if, if you wanna see it. The concept's really simple. They just mail you like shavers for your face. They're, they're not reinventing like a new shaver that has like six fucking blades, you know? Like it's, it's still a razor, they're just now mailing it to you. But they made a really clever explainer video that took off like wildfire and that ended up carrying them into a round of funding, which eventually ended up getting them bought out for billion with a B, a billion dollars. I haven't made a billion dollars in three years. I don't know about you guys, but that's amazing. You know, like it's a really big deal. Uh, I cite a few other companies in here. Uh, Nova Resume is a local one. Uh, they're a startup out here that basically does resume templates. Not the sexiest thing in the world. They made a, a resume for what Elon Musk's resume would look like. I, I mean, Elon Musk doesn't need a fucking resume. He's Elon Musk. But it's one of those things that took off like wildfire, got published in the New York Times, uh, Times Magazine, Forbes, a bunch of these other places. That single article has propelled them to get 2 million unique visitors a month. It's crazy. And I'm like, how long did it take you to make that resume? He's like, I don't know, like an hour and a half, two hours. <coughs> it's crazy, but it was a really clever idea and it worked out. Uh, so I, I think building stuff like that is, is <clears throat> sorry, too many cigarettes. Uh, building stuff like that is the way to go. Uh, I'm gonna run through these tools in the essence of saving time. Um, 
And if somebody can let me know when we come up on the, the hour mark, that would be helpful. So we take a little break before finishing it out. Uh, so creating good visuals. If you're not a designer, here's a bunch of tools for you. Canva is pretty much the standard if you don't know how to use Photoshop, but honestly, Photoshop's not going away. And I think there's so many great little tutorials that you can pick up on so quickly. And in terms of finding a free version, uh, that shit's online and it's really easy to find. I've had like pirated versions since I was like 16. So go out and get it. It's crazy. Um, I think in terms of like writing really good content, Fiverr is, is a great resource. You also have uh, Black Hat World where I've been able to get articles for anywhere from $10 for 1,500 words upwards to I think the most expensive ones were like $15 for 1,500 words. I mean, you can get it. And content works, you know, especially for exchanges. Uh, also, this is sometimes what interns uh, are really excited to get involved with is writing amazing content. Um, there's also Upwork and tools like Grammarly uh, really help. So a lot of different ways to do that. Um, I, I use this image just because it's, it's kind of fun. They don't have Radio Shack at well, They don't have Radio Shack anywhere anymore. They went out of business. Uh, but this is an advertisement for basically all the products that your, your phone, your smartphone does nowadays. And it's like a bunch of products. I love that it's like $1,600 for like that really shitty like boxy computer. But it's one of those things like your phone does all this stuff. So if you don't own an expensive camera, it's okay. You can still use your cell phone. It's better than any camera that I used up, up until probably like 2004. So, I mean, in terms of having the technology, it's there. Every 13-year-old knows how to cut up videos. Hopefully, you guys should know how to do that too. And that's the stuff that really converts. Gets more views, gets more uses. So, by all means, use that. Uh, Lumen 5 does have a, uh, a really nice um, like trial version. It basically allows you to submit an article, drop an article in it using AI. It basically subs in videos. So you can essentially create these BuzzFeed style videos really easily with the text over top. We stopped doing it because I think it took a lot of extra work and we were using images rather than video. I still think it works and it works differently for every brand, but you can essentially automate creating a lot of these things. Loom and Screener are free tools for screen capture. Showing any how-to or guide video with a screen capture, just like I'm screen capturing today, really easy to do and I think there's a ton of value in that. Um, and video editing, dime a dozen in terms of, of being able to pick up platforms. Uh, explainer videos, I'm not going to go into that stuff, but there's a bunch of tools there if you want to get the slides later. Um, not having time is totally not an excuse. I mean, this stuff takes maybe an hour a week to be able to put together 15 different posts that you can schedule using Buffer, which has a free version up to three different social media platforms. The idea is you could schedule all of your social media on a personal level within an hour each week or potentially for your company. It's just automating this stuff, and that's the idea. Spend a little bit of time putting together something great. I really think there's value there. Uh, curation is a ton of fun, and this is where I start to jump out of the presentation. So curation is the concept of basically taking somebody else's work and putting it onto your newsfeed or uh, onto your, your Facebook, LinkedIn, and giving people a chance to engage with something that they find interesting and relevant, but you didn't necessarily create, or potentially using it as inspiration to create something better. That's the concept behind the skyscraper technique. A uh, guy by the name of Brian Dean who runs Backlinko, which is a really awesome blog for those that are into social media, but more so SEO. Uh, the concept is basically look at all your competitors using Ahrefs and then pick out their best piece of content and then beat them at their best piece of content by making something slightly better. Let me show you what I mean on that. So bear with me here. I'm going to hit refresh. And for those that are uh, wondering how much Ahrefs is, we have access to uh, a very expensive version of Ahrefs and there's a lot of different group uh, memberships for tools that ordinary people couldn't afford. So something to consider if that's the way you want to play it. Give me a second here. Cool. All right. So one of the um, <clears throat> one of the many competitors that we go up against is Board of Innovation. There we go. So the idea is I can look them up, and by going down to top contents down here, 
I can then see what is the content that is engaged with the most across all social media and also has the most referring domains. Referring domains is basically when I, on my website, uh, valuer.ai, links to Board of Innovation. Now, that is a <coughs> referring domain or a backlink. The idea is that I can see here that these are their top pieces of content. And often it is one or two pieces of content that end up <clears throat> driving 80% of your traffic. It's just how it works. So if I wanted to basically beat these guys at their own game, uh, this would be an easy one for me to do. They do 50 plus business models. I would do 50 plus business, or no, it would be 75 plus gangster, badass business models you need to know about now. All of a sudden, I'm actually beating them at their best game, right? It's taking their best player out and being like, that guy's dead on the field. Now I'm going to rank for the same keywords that my competitors are. And because mine's newer, because it's longer, and because there's more content in there, there's a much higher chance of me actually outranking my competitors. So it's beating them at their best game. I love doing this stuff. So you can also do that within a few different areas on social media as well, and I'm going to cover that in the next slide. But any questions about that? I'm not saying go out and steal and copy word for word the content. I'm saying take the idea as inspiration, make something better. It's pretty straightforward. <clears throat> um, some of the stuff for social media, I think, is a little more interesting. Everybody here has heard of Reddit, right? Ish. Cool. So Reddit is, their tagline is like the front page of the internet. <clears throat> so within uh, Valuer, we work with a lot of startups. So I'm going to put a keyword in like startups. <clears throat> And then I'm going to sort by the last month to get a general feel for what types of stuff that has been put out on Reddit has gotten so much engagement that it's practically flawless. Because in order to get 27,000 likes within 30 days on Reddit, it means it's got to be really good. So either I'm going to share the piece directly, or if it's a meme or it's something that I feel like I can make a better version of, then fuck it. I'm going to make my own version and basically get it out there because this is a version of social proof. A bunch of other people liked it over here. So if I put it over here, I guarantee you a bunch of other people are going to like it as well. So uh, we're not like one of those other startup starter pack. So this is a meme. I could certainly add in my own images and I could essentially share this, know that I'm getting a ton of engagement because it worked over uh, on, uh, on Reddit. The idea is that you need to be able to think kind of actively about what are my competitors doing? What are other people having success with? And it works. I do like that. That's actually pretty good. So, <laughs> so I think there's a lot of different things that you can really look into in terms of using Reddit as a resource to find the best stuff within your niche. And the concept is the way that you can find other ways of, of searching for a product within your niche. Maybe somebody that is working on a, a startup give me the niche that you're working on or not you guys. I know you guys are in valuer. Somebody have like a, an industry that they're working on that I could throw out. Oh guys, nobody wants to jump. Yes. Uh, recycled, furniture. recycled furniture. Good one. So one of my favorite sites is answered public. And for those that haven't seen this, this is a really cool tool to be able to develop keywords and also content. So answerthepublic.com. I got this uh, really impatient dude that's like, come on, come on. And it was recycled. I'm not going to spell that right. <laughs> recycled furniture. There we go. Get questions. So the idea is that it breaks it down by the who, what, why, where, when, how. And it also then breaks it down by related keywords and then also related searches. So the concept is that you could essentially tease out some of the more interesting buzzwords and throw those into the mix, uh, just as I did on Reddit, to be able to continue to find new and interesting stuff that's either directly related or loosely related to your customers, your industry, your product, your service, whatever it is. So why is recycled <laughs> teak for, I don't know what that means. What is recycled, ah, bummer. I think there's a lot of good stuff in here if you do a little digging. Recycled furniture art, that's going to be interesting. But let's just take recycled furniture and see what happens when we throw it into Reddit within the last 30 days. <clears throat> Nothing really jumps out. 
So you have like uh, uh, sort of, yeah, I don't know. This could be something that you would potentially share on a LinkedIn or, or Facebook page in order to increase engagement. Uh, I think the idea is that success begets success. So as people continue to engage with stuff that's on your page, it opens up more access to more impressions in the future. If you consistently get zero likes, Facebook has, and LinkedIn, has no incentive of actually showing it to anybody that actually cares because no matter what you put out, you get nothing. So you might as well put out good stuff. And I'll show some different concepts down the road, but I think that's a really interesting way to do it. You can also do this within Quora. Uh, for those that haven't used Quora, Quora is basically like a question and answer uh, platform. So Quora.com. Now I'll hit this on top pages. So these are the top pages as they rank within Quora. And I would take a uh, particular keyword and basically throw it in there. So again, I would do it for startups. And it will tell me which questions are the highest ranking questions of all time within Quora. So <clears throat> this question right here, uh, basically for startups incorporating in Delaware, what firms be like, well, I don't know what that's all about, but have you seen my website? <laughs> you know, like whatever. I think there's a million different ways to dance around the question. You can read some of the other questions and you can also find Fiverr gigs where people basically boost your, your likes or thumbs up by 5, 10, 15, 20 for five bucks, essentially becoming the top comment and people click on the link of like the top three comments. So the idea is you're basically kind of hacking the game there. There's a lot of different ways to do that. Uh, which are the hottest machine learning startups? Of course, I would say, well, there's a lot of really good ones out there, but I think Valuer.ai would probably be the top one and then link to us. So it's something to think about for your own brand. And, and this kind of stuff works, and there's not a lot of people doing it. There are some people that are out there to, to kind of game the system, but not on scale and not for every industry, obviously not for the ones that everybody in this room would possibly be working on. So a really cool technique and an awesome growth hack if you have some time to play with it. Um, <clears throat> Cool. So some posting tools. I put a link down here because I think everybody ends up going for like the default, which is either Hootsuite or Buffer. Hootsuite, uh, I've kind of fallen out of love with because they only give you a limited trial. Buffer gives you up to three pages across all the networks to be able to continue to put, st uh, put stuff out there, basically up to, I think it's 50 posts. You have a bunch of other ones that give you potentially a trial version. You have the pricing here. Um, there's a lot, like a lot, a lot. So on this list, there's 93. <laughs> so I would encourage you to see what kind of fits your needs. Uh, and there's some that have uh, recommendations, social listening, uh, a million different machine learning, uh, potential uh, opportunities in terms of teasing out influencers. Figure out what you're really missing and what you want to use it for. But this is linked inside of that post, and I think there's a ton of value there. Uh, cool. I'm actually going to continue without uh, my yeah without it being full screen because the rest of this I'm I'm kind of jumping back and forth between the different areas. So uh, the next section I'm going to go into social media. We're doing pretty good on time. I'm thinking we could take a break in about ten minutes. Um, cool. So social media. There's so much to cover here. Uh, I'm going to cover some growth hacks, some common sense stuff, and hopefully stuff that you can then immediately use. I've already explained social proof or at least mentioned it. The whole idea is very simple. People want to like stuff that other people seem to like. So if you're walking down the street on a, I don't know, holiday or on vacation and you see the really crowded cafe and the cafe with fucking nobody, you're going to look at both of those and which ones do you think you pick? It's the one that's crowded because you're like, well, that place is cool. Everybody's there. I want to be like everybody. Nobody goes to the one that nobody's eating at because you immediately assume it's a dump or there must be something wrong. It's the same thing with your content. If nobody engages with your content, it means that, eh, well, I don't want to be the first one to like it, so I won't. Uh, and you can see this across some really like reputable companies. Uh, Crunchbase is one of our biggest competitors. Who here's heard of Crunchbase? Just, okay, cool. So I, I'll go on Crunchbase just real quick because it's, it's kind of like, it, like it throws me off. A lot of their posts either have one like or zero. So like even the guy that posts it doesn't like their own shit, which is kind of funny when you think about it because it's like a huge company. 
Um, but let me go to Crunchbase Facebook there. And realize that you're not the only one if you're managing somebody else's page and you realize that you're not getting the engagement that maybe you once had. And there's a number of reasons for that. So this went out an hour ago. One like. Thanks, Mom. Um, let's see. One like. <laughs> Three. All right. One. <laughs> you know, like that sucks. Like that's a lot of work. Somebody spent time to do that. And by the way, if you look up here, there's 26,000 people. You're telling me out of 26,000 people, there's only one dude out there that was like, all right, cool, like whatever. Like you guys are all right. You know, like that's weird. And the reason for that is it's quite obvious they got fake likes. There's a, a billion fake accounts out there. There's, there's been a, a number of news articles that stipulate that half of all Facebook accounts are fake. How many people here have created a fake Facebook account or a second account? Yes. Oh, bullshit. I know that other people have stalked their exes, but it's fine. The concept is there's a lot of that, and there's a lot of bots that actually end up doing a lot of that. I include a video, and I think there's time to show it, but realize that there's no value in encouraging fake likes by buying those off of Fiverr or any number of websites. And don't be upset that you're not getting the engagement you think you should get because out of 26,000, these guys are getting... Not a lot of anything. There's, there's zero. I'll be the one guy. You're welcome. I mean, it, it's crazy. So I, I don't get it. So that's that. I, I think there's something to be said for, and you can't really see that, but uh, it's a very different type of pull when you're trying to focus on business to business versus business to consumer. Make no mistake, I very highly doubt that anybody's ever going to get a fucking valuer tattoo on their arm. If they do, they're an idiot, right? But you're also an idiot if you get your favorite brand, <laughs> you know, like tattooed, like you're an idiot. That's crazy, but a lot of people do it. But the reason that they, they get these things on them or, or they're so inspired is because it's a lifestyle. And that's what they're selling with this branding. And you can see this whenever you watch a commercial about your favorite brand. It resonates with you. It shows people that potentially look like you. It shows the activities that you probably either want to do or aspire to be. You know, and I don't know about Paps Blue, Blue Ribbon, but I don't know. I, I find it very odd that people assume that you're going to get super fired up about something that doesn't always matter, right? Business to business software, nobody's going to be tattooing that because it doesn't really matter. There's no brand that resonates to them. Something that's a consumer level, maybe a, a certain type of car or a certain type of clothing. I don't know, maybe. But the fact that they've done such a great job in terms of branding themselves that people are willing to ink themselves permanently says something about what they've established in terms of a brand identity. And I think it's incredibly important to look at. So I'm going to talk a little bit about algorithms here. Every time that I do this, I think I lose half the people, so I'm going to try to oversimplify. So the idea is that when you post on social media, your brand is not exposed to all of your followers. Let's just say your personal Facebook account. On average, the exposure that your specific post gets, let's say you post like, hey mom, I'm at CBS for an event, uh, selfie. Right? You post that, it's going to less than 10% of your audience. So of, let's say you have 1,000 friends, maybe 100 will actually get exposed as an impression seeing it on their newsfeed. Now based on whether or not people engage with it early means it's going to be put out to either a larger audience or not at all. And most people don't know that and it's surprising. Our news feeds would explode. This is why Twitter was so difficult to work with for the first couple of years because your fucking feed was going like this. There was no way to be able to curate stuff to be able to say, well, I really like these things from this person, so show me more of this person. The concept is Facebook is trying to be essentially, and this is where the metaphor gets a little weird, uh, it's trying to be a buffet owner that is really eager to please. Right, so if you know that the fucking cobbler thing on the bottom, I, I need to use like more recognizable foods. I don't know what any of that stuff is. But if that bottom dish is really delicious and people are eating it up, the buffet owner wants to be, he wants to impress his audience. He wants to impress his customers. So he puts out more of it, meaning more exposure. So the idea is very simple. Posts that get exposed uh, to a larger audience tend to get more engagement. Posts that get a higher engagement early tend to get exposed to more people. So the goal is to get as many likes as possible within a very short period of time as soon as it goes live. This is why it matters in terms of timing when you post. 
If you post at two in the morning, there's a far less likelihood that it's actually gonna get seen by anybody by nine or 10 a.m. the next day, depending on what's in the post. Um, I, I'm sure that there's some algorithm be like, well, if somebody's posting some shit at three, it's gotta be good, you know? Who knows? Um, but I, I think there's something to be said for that. I think there's also a push towards meaningful engagement. You're seeing a lot of announcements come out of LinkedIn and Facebook where they're essentially saying, look, we're doing away with like this junk, uh, clickbaity kind of stuff. This is why a lot of people are trying to drift away from that. It's also why, I don't know, you don't see as many of kind of these lowest common denominator fight club style videos hitting your newsfeed because they've, they've really tried to ramp down on that stuff. If it's absolute junk, fake news, that kind of thing, they're trying to dismiss this kind of stuff. And they're also trying to dismiss the stuff that people don't actually really engage with. Articles that people are not ever clicking on, they're just like, yeah, I agree with that. Never read the article. I, I've gotten into so many fights about the, um, the, the catcalling video. <laughs> and like, there's this great video, it's like why everybody should be catcalling. And it's, it's actually about a person calling their cat on a, a bed, but people are like, this is unacceptable. It's like, you fucking didn't watch the video. It was, it was a joke because people are yelling at their cats, like, come on, Snickers, come on the bed. You know, It's this whole thing of exposing people don't read 90% of the stuff that they engage with. You just saw me like something on Crunchbase. I didn't read their article, but I engaged with it. So they're trying to get more people to actually click on the article, read what is in there, and then have a meaningful discussion within the comments section. So the weighting has completely changed in terms of what matters within the algorithms. There we go. So I, I mentioned this before in terms of video, but the other trends are, are, are definitely taking place in terms of video, right? And we've definitely seen that. I, I, I've already mentioned the 85% of videos are watched with the sound off. It is the largest community in the world online, Facebook. It, it's pushing, again, as I mentioned, a, a billion of them are, are fake, or half of, of a billion are fake. But we're talking about the community that is online the most for the longest period of time is on Facebook. So the concept is when in doubt, post on that platform because it tends to get the most engagement. And a secondary for business to consumer is gonna be Instagram. A secondary for business to business is gonna be LinkedIn. Um, cool. I, they have a couple of links in here, but I, I don't think it matters. Um, some clickbaity things that you might see in some growth hacking forums are a mixed bag because they say they're not working, but I actually think some of them are. Uh, there's something called vote baiting, uh, which is essentially using the reaction emojis to be able to vote for your favorite song of the 90s. And the smiley face means this song, and the crying face means Backstreet Boys or whatever. The concept is it's not using the platform for its intended use, therefore they're trying to get rid of people that try to hack that. The other concept is share baiting, like tag somebody who's totally this guy or tag your neighborhood drug dealer, whatever. The concept is when you're trying to get people to engage for the sake of engagement, you're hacking the content in a way that is misleading. So a lot of that stuff is, is going away. Comment baiting when you're in a group, where's everybody from? You know, like hit uh, 411 if you want me to give you the lowdown on this new growth hack. So you're not necessarily damaging the use of the group if you're doing this inside of groups. You're turning down your own reach as an account individually on Facebook. And LinkedIn's definitely ramping down on it too. Um, there's a million different things to go into on that stuff and it, it's, it's funny because like it's an arms race, right? When you're growth hacking stuff. And what worked two years ago, like doing this comment baiting stuff, it really doesn't work anymore. And, and so you have to get more clever. And I'm gonna go into a couple of things uh, in the near future, but yeah. Does it make sense to take a break or should I keep going? What's everybody feeling? Hands up for break. All right. Hands up for no break. <laughs> All right, no break it is. We'll, we'll go for another like 15. Cool. All right, I wanna go into LinkedIn because I think there's some value here. Um, the ideal length of a post is 25 words, not characters. Uh, it gives you enough room to be able to actually tell a narrative or get something in the way of insight, something interesting. You'll notice that if you actually write longer paragraphs uh, that are broken up by a sentence and a half, two sentences at a time, these things tend to get engaged with because they're trying to get people to scroll and read stuff. So test it out. Try to write something that is 1,300 characters. Uh, you'd be surprised how fast that goes. 
and make it relevant to your industry. Uh, I was mentioning it earlier. I think there's some really interesting things that they're testing out on the different platforms, but especially on LinkedIn. Um, groups are still a total fucking waste of time on LinkedIn. Uh, I don't see them in my news feed. I don't understand why they're still there. We're trying some cool stuff on there, but it, it's still not really hitting the way that I'm hoping it would. So, um, yeah, not a big deal. Uh, one of the things that I definitely link to in this slide and you need to make sure that you have is basically taking the SRT file or the, uh, the closed captioning, the captions off of your YouTube videos in order to push them onto your LinkedIn videos. It's basically a, a two minute video that basically goes through, this is where you post, this is how you get into the menu, this is where you download, this is how you change it so that you can upload it directly into LinkedIn alongside your video. LinkedIn is aware that any time that a upload contains an SRT file, they're going to give it a lot more exposure. So if you are putting out any video content on LinkedIn, it takes an extra five minutes to go to YouTube, upload it there, download your SRT file, and make sure it has captions so people will actually stop and look at it. I could I, I can continue to preach it. And I, I think most people probably won't do it, but it fucking works. So if you want to do something that works, I'm telling you, this this absolutely works. It increases the engagement every single time. Um, I don't know. You guys can look at this slide uh, another time. It's basically the best times to post and the, the types of stuff that is working, but this is available for you afterwards. I think one of the things that I've tested personally on my LinkedIn that's always incredible to, to see how it's panned out is that emojis continue to get a higher amount of engagement. I've seen posts that are, uh, well, blogs that basically state something to the effect of, I think it was 15%. Out of uh, HubSpot, they put out a statistic that was 25.4% of increased engagement when you add emojis. So a fucking rocket ship and one of those little fire icons. For whatever reason, people are like, oh, well, this has got to be important. <laughs> I don't understand why that's a thing, but it is. So try it out. I, I kid you not, add a couple of emojis and see what happens. I, I really think there's there's some value there. And in terms of worrying whether or not it's going to like make your brand look unofficial, that, that's not even a thing. We talk to corporate executives all the time, and I put fucking emojis and Mario memes on our newsfeed, and nobody calls us up saying, hey, you guys are a bunch of amateurs. Like, no, it's not the fucking case. Look at the scoreboard. You know, so realize that this is how everybody is starting to kind of take advantage of attention. And that's what we're all fighting for is this this really desperate attempt to get people to glance at something for a few moments. So I think there's some value there. Uh, let's see. There's I don't know. Blog summaries is something that we've had some fun with. Uh, I haven't actually experimented enough on LinkedIn for me to say with, with some certainty that a summarized version of our LinkedIn, uh, well, our article on LinkedIn inside of a personal article section would work, but we have, we've caught fire in a bottle with uh, the, <coughs> the medium, with medium. How many people have heard of medium? It's a blog network. Okay, cool. Yeah, so we do a shortened version of every article that we put out. We wait two weeks before posting it, but the idea is it's basically the same thing. We link to the article. The last one that we put out had 593 claps, and it's crazy because we haven't really done much work on this. It's been over the span of five weeks, and it just continues to build. It's insane. So the idea is reuse your content. If you wrote it once, make a shorter summary and give people a fucking chance to click on that full version and see what happens because we're continuing to get a ton of engagement off of doing that. And you might have the same thing that happens when you're creating articles within LinkedIn as well. So if you've already done the work, make a summary, see what happens. Uh, this is the last thing I'll show before we take a little break. Uh, this is one of those arms race things that will go away within probably the next three to four months. Uh, but right now it's cool because like nobody knows about it. Um, so the idea is you can automate your LinkedIn posts in terms of engagement. So you get a bunch of people as we've done to join uh, what they call LemPod. Uh, and we have a channel within that, a pod. So the idea is that any time that uh, the administrator, me, posts a link, everybody will automatically go in and you set the timing for, let's see, yeah, this one. You set the timing for 20 seconds or five minutes, and then every 20 seconds, everybody within that pod who is a member likes and automatically comments on whatever we've set the comments for. So there was a screenshot. Now, hold on, let me pull up the article. 
just to kind of drive the point home. It's five bucks, but I I really do think it's it's absolutely worth it. So there it is. Cool. So there's the uh, article. There's 29 likes and 18 comments, and it's not that good of an article. It's <laughs> it's like. It's like three paragraphs. Uh, it was a douchebag PR agency that I really don't like working with. Uh, that was like, hey, we got you on the internet. It's like, nice job. Um, so we decided to test it out on this post. And you can see, yeah, Jessica, go valuer. You totally didn't write that. Um, so yeah, it's this really fun way of how do I automate this? How do I get, because I, I can tell you right now, for those that have tried to manage social media within an office, you can pay people at the front door to say, just when you go back to your desk, here's a hundred bucks. Just go online and like something real quick. That's all I'm asking. People still won't do it. It's it's the most absurd thing because nobody cares. It, you know, it's like, eh, I don't know, busy. It's crazy. So all you have to do is say, hey, real quick, just jump on. I see what <laughs> I see what's happening. Uh, I got logged out because I had this thing open. So there is a very good chance that LinkedIn has already uh, <laughs> has figured this one out. I'll have to get back to you guys and let you know whether or not that's the case. Um, but obviously, like nothing gold ever lasts. And, and the idea is everything within growth hacking is an arms race because if you're trying to kind of work around the system, eventually the system is going to correct for the flaw. And, and this is what we're, we're talking about here. But I still think it's a really fun way of, of getting a shitload of likes for something that doesn't deserve it. I think it's really cool. Um, so last thing that I'll show is... Sometimes you have no idea where it comes from, uh, and this was this was a post that I I basically recorded myself biking on my way to work, and now I have to sign in because of Lempod. Hold on. Yes, I'm not a robot that I know of. All right, cool. Let's see if this works. Yeah, so this was a video of me biking to work. Uh, 679 likes, 44 comments, 44,637 views. It took me all of however long this video is, two minutes and 44 seconds of me just biking, going, uh, you know, on my way. To, nothing happens. It's just me biking in Copenhagen. And people are like, oh, this is amazing. And you have no idea how much fucking time I've spent writing articles for hours on end where it's like two fucking likes. You know, it's, it's incredible. So you never know where it comes from. And that's the crazy thing about content and social media in general is you don't know what kind of stuff works. I, I did this as a lark just to see what would happen. And the the odd part is like people engaged with it. I don't understand why other than people are like, oh, Nordic country is like, cool, I want to bike to work. And it's like, okay, yeah, great. It works. I, I don't understand it. This to, to date has been by <laughs> multiples of 10, the most engaged posts I've ever put out. And I've spent hours putting stuff out, uh, days. So I think it's just important to note that maybe things that we don't deem to be as uh, relevant or as important sometimes end up being the best things. And that's why it's important to just throw stuff out there and, and try stuff. Um, cool. What do you say we take like a five-minute break uh, back here at 5.15? Cool? All right.